thank you so much for checking out the analytical reading program. We're grateful to have this time and ultimately have time with really a collection of people who, as Dr. Mark Lewis was just pointing out, are actually championing a level of innovation that has never happened in our space. And I mean internationally, really focusing on the fundamental aspect in our equation here, which is you know, the plant itself and the relationship between plants and people, but using technology and tools to go into new levels of expression of this ancient relationship that I think are going to provide tremendous and that ultimately each one of these people is you know, just a monstrous force of innovation and it's an honor to get to moderate this panel. My name's Jeremy Plum. I'm from Portland, Oregon. I'm Director of Production Science at Proof Cultivar. It's a high-tech controlled environment facility and I've been working in cannabis my whole life. Founded a dispensary called Pharma, co-founded Open Cannabis Project and founded an event called the Cultivation Classic in Portland. Um, I've got the honor of working with... I've had the honor of working with some of these folks. I've been on panels over the years, and I feel like in a bit of a way, I don't know how to quite say, this year, things are really going to a new level. And, and really, I want to make sure to allocate plenty of time to hearing where those levels are. So I'd like to start with a basic question. Analytical breeding, implies that there is technology facilitating outcomes in the genomic space, and that ultimately that results in a chemotypic outcome. But what I would like to talk about first would be just to have them introduce themselves and then go into, you know, what is your experience with using analytics and breeding to actually get into this space of creating plants that are more useful and to really um, break new ground? But first, uh, some introductions. Okay, um, my name is Josh. Josh Warzer. Uh, I'm the president of SC Labs, and we're an analytical testing lab based in Santa Cruz. I've been testing cannabis now for almost 10 years. I started out actually working at the Reggie Shop, Steep Hill, um, worked there for a year, and, and, and I don't have experience with breeding. I have experience with the analytical side of things and supporting breeders, and um, it's just been exciting to see people kind of take breeding to the next level from kind of the you know garage breeding that we had early on, where we're just crossing hybrids and hoping for something interesting to, you know, kind of what we're seeing today, which is a really interesting chemotypic expression that um, is kind of finally tapping into the potential of, of, of what cannabis can do. I mean, you have this plant that can produce all these very unique, interesting bioactive cannabinoids, and really we're only playing with a couple of them, and a plant that can also produce all this unique terpene um, profile that can potentiate those effects potentially um, and, and give unique flavors and aroma to cannabis, and we're really only working with, you know, um, you know, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten of those cannabinoids. So it, it, that's that's been exciting to see these people really kind of starting to to challenge that and challenge the, what the plant can do, and uh, um, and, and, and produce interesting, cool, unique, unique uh, strains. I'm Roger Gugino. I'm the president of uh, Steve Hill. I'm also the director of R and D. Um, for me, this has been a really exciting time because I, I come out of plant biotech, and um, and so this has been interesting to see an industry that should have as much information about their plant as any other cash crop, because we are as big a cash crop as any other crop in the United States. Um, but you know, it was interesting for me to be able to come into this industry and say, oh wow, we know nothing, and then to start to compile the data from the tens of thousands tests that we've done and, and to start to see trends and those trends are what Josh is talking about right where we can start to see oh these plants obviously CBD and THC were the first ones right but we have a plant that makes over 500 active compounds right and by active compounds I mean by they have biological activity that we know of because we know of their corresponding or exactly the same compounds in other plants right so we know that they have functionality um, and so you know what we what we can do at the analytical chemistry level is actually use some of those tests as markers for breeding without even going into genetics, right? So as long as you have an outcome, you can follow it, right? So that's the beauty of analytical chemistry in the, in the early days of the industry because there were markers, you could see the results of a, of a breeding program. And now we've taken it to the next level where we now have marker-assisted breeding. We, we start to do the same things that the Monsantos and the Dow Ags can do. And, and those things will help improve the product, products that we make on our side as well before waiting for Big Ag to get into it, so. Seth Crawford, uh, co-founder of Oregon CBD. We're an industrial hemp seed research and development company based in Oregon. 
Uh, okay, that wasn't funny. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, my background. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. I get that a lot. I get that. Uh, my background is uh, I'm actually a PhD in sociology, and my my analytical training was in uh, analyzing large multi-causal data sets, uh, looking at world energy problems. Uh, I also had a killer breeding facility in my garage for about 10 years. <laughs> so I was teaching a cannabis policy class at Oregon State where I taught for uh, 13 years, and it happened to coincide with legalization in Oregon, and that was a recreational adult use THC legalization and industrial hemp. And industrial hemp was legalized uh, in Oregon one month before the 2014 Farm Bill passed. Uh, I read the Farm Bill, read the Oregon law, and said, oh man, we've got plans to fit that bill. I think we can make this work. And the, the main driver of this for me was moving from uh, plant counts and canopy size limits to unlimited numbers of plants. Because it, you know, as soon as you have access to very large populations and you have those analytical capabilities, you can start to tease apart some of the most incredible things from this plant. Um, they manifest themselves consistently as long as you are looking. Uh, today, we are uh, going into our fifth year of production. We had over 4,000 acres of industrial hemp grown in the United States using our high CBD, uh, high terpene content, uh, feminized industrial hemp seed. And we're looking at uh, about 100 million seed capacity for this upcoming year with the expansion of the Farm Bill, uh, in addition to a number of different novel compounds that we've successfully isolated. Ow! <laughs> For those of you guys that don't know, Seth has also developed one of the very impressive American uh, high CDG cultivars, which is uh, quite a feat that we haven't seen anything quite like that on the marketplace, so big props to you for that. Uh, my name is Ryan Lee. I'm a plant breeder. I'm a uh, founder of uh, Chimera Genetics, which is a seed company we run out of Europe, and uh, also have a Canadian company called Chemovar Consulting, and we do, like I said, genetic imports for Canadian LPs. And, uh, plant breeding. I also worked with Napro Research, Mark Lewis, for a few years down here between 2013 and 2016, and uh, we had a lot of fun developing some pretty interesting chemovars, some of which you saw on the screen in the previous presentation. Um, so on, you know, on analytics, you know, how, how do we how, how do we talk about how it impacts us as cultivators and selectors and breeders? And you know, I think. The truth is that we've all we've all been doing this all along. You know, anybody that's selecting plants or growing plants and selecting using our nose and our our our, our lungs and our you know our brain bioassaying these things. Um, analytics really gives us a sixth or seventh sense, right? A way to look at these plants that we can't you know we can't you can't pick up a flower and smell it and say oh there's seven milligrams of limonene in it. Right? So we, we rely on technology to do that. And since we started relying on technology, we've seen some pretty interesting things. You know, I mean, for example, uh, Molecular Farms last year, one of our clients through NAPRO, they won first place um, in, a, in a couple of different categories. One of them was the THC category with their Lemon Crush, and that was you know, one of the first varieties that was really created through directed analysis, um, you know, chasing compounds using a laboratory. And there are some people in the community that didn't like that. They said that they cheated, right? Well, to me, it's not cheating to use a, a, an analytical method. It's like we're, we're, we're in this developing industry and we want to use all the technology that we can to further our goal because our goal is to further the plant, right? To make better plants for consumers, better plants for growers. And the laboratory is just a tool to help us do that. Wonderful. I would like to actually hear just a couple of specific examples of using the analytical technology, which clearly you know, culminates in a kind of chemotypic analysis that will validate that the phytochemical inventory of a plant accurately um, has these compounds. But ultimately, there's other analytical tools that are being used to optimize breeding and the outcomes in the plants that we're working with. I'm wondering if, Seth, maybe you could describe a little bit about other tools you have used um, prior to the chemotype to optimize the plants and to get to these outrageous outcomes. Like, by the way, not just what we're calling a type four plant, which is CBD knockout to have high CBG, and like the, the most I've heard actually from a valid lab result so far, anywhere, but also I'm hearing a type five plant, cannabinoid null, 
so rich in terpenes and no other cannabinoids, which has a lot of very interesting implications, but it says anything about your fucking amazing story <laughs> <laughs> that you can share. It's honoring. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate that. Uh, besides lots and lots of testing, um, we, we spend literally years in the lab using every single uh, testing and analytical tool that we can. Uh, there's a Orange Photonics is a good example. They're a, a vendor here. Uh, it's a it's sort of a rough HPLC system that we use for screening, uh, but it allows us to, and it doesn't work right, actually, for a number of the compounds that we're looking for, but it messes up in a way that's predictable. And if you run... <laughs> if, 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 you, if you run 5,000 tests with the machine and you've got all the data to back it up, you look at it and go, okay, and you've set it off for third-party analysis with a competent lab, uh, you can start to see the pattern emerge, right? And this is this is really what we're uh, what we're looking at. The main thing that we do outside of the analytical testing is actual field trials for our cultivars that we release to, to farmers, um, which is something that is sort of a it's a misnomer in the THC industry for the most part because of the small sample size that most farmers are working with. Uh, as Mark said earlier at that previous presentation. You know, 10 phenotypes and 10 seeds, that's a good thing, right? Uh, <laughs> when you're doing something that is literally thousands of acres at a time, you cannot have that type of phenotypic variation. Um, we say that our, our plants are homozygous for very particular traits. Uh, we know that because we've done large-scale field trials the year before where we evaluated 20 different mothers that were separated out from 1,000 different plants to get to that point to see which one actually recombines and creates a good field plant that farmers can uh, succeed with. It's almost like when, when you're seeing thousands of acres of your seed out there, um, the plants are naked. If there was any error in your breeding, it's going to show up and people are not going to be happy, uh, which was evidence this year in Oregon with a, a number of, say, less than savory industrial hemp seed providers. Wonderful, thank you. Ryan, I'm wondering, with your experience, not just with NAPRO, but especially with NAPRO, and the survey of the chemoscape that took place in California, which actually, I'm not sure if anybody is aware, but if you missed this last talk that Dr. Mark Lewis led, NAPRO led an effort that was a very sophisticated effort to look at what is out there. You know, what's beyond THC and CBD, and what's the inventory of this market? And ultimately, it was the most mature work I've seen. I know you were deeply involved with that. Can you talk about some of the analytical work outside of the chemotype data, that were, or the analytical tools, rather, that were used to be productive in um, creating a really mature body of work? Well, we really looked at chemistry. So, you know, Mark's a, Mark's a chemist, and obviously that kind of drives the, the, the mission. Um, but, you know, Mark has this thing he says, and it's very true, the, 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 the metabolome, or the chemistry that is produced by the plant, is really a reflection of the genome. And so like, like Reggie was saying earlier, we don't necessarily have to go and use all these tools to start poking around the genome when just by using a chemistry assay, we can actually get a, a whole bunch of information about what the plant produces. So um, that was really our focus was, was you know, HPLC for cannabinoids and uh, GCFID for, for, for terpenoids. And uh, it, you know, we had the, like, like SC and, and Steve Hill, we did intake for dispensaries and, you know, in the process of these many tens of thousands of samples that came through the laboratory with the flower destined to end up on the shelves of a dispensary, we were able to take this analytical data and really plot what we saw in the market. And, uh, and I think SC Labs and Steepa Labs probably have very similar data as well, right? You get, as you're running thousands and thousands of tests, you start to group things and see that there's different types and, and you see what exists in the market, but you also see the holes and what doesn't exist in the market. It, right, like what we know theoretically exists in the space, and and then how do we fill those those needs? Like Mark said earlier, it's like that's innovation, right? You see, you see where what's what's a missing skew, and then we can use that information to go and develop that. One of the qualities I know that I hear advanced breeders speaking to as an outcome of analytically assisted breeding is really hitting stabilization. I, I think there's been some potentially like abuse of that idea in that. We don't know what we're talking about when we talk about stability in a broad and general sense. Um, as Seth pointed out, I think it's important to think about what sort of traits we're trying to stabilize and see consistent and homozygous expression in. I'm curious if you could describe 
some of the traits that um, you would prioritize in terms of stabilizing for consumer relevance and market relevance? Uh, it totally depends on what your goal is. And any good breeding project starts with that, that originating question, what is your goal? Are you trying to make... Are you trying to have a, a fuel-flavored, dense, tall, short-flowering plant, or are you looking for something that has other characteristics? It's, it's, that is everything. And then you build, build out from there. Can you make it personal? What is your goal? Where are you going? My goal is to make sure that we have uh, access to all of these different compounds for people and animals at a reasonable price. Uh, yeah. There's been... <laughs> There's been fantastic, uh, fantastic research has uh, been done by GW Pharmaceuticals. They had a 15-year monopoly, a uh, huge head start in this industry, and they have these wonderful plants that just sit in a building. Like, they're not doing any good right now. And while there's great information that can be derived from uh, you know, pharmaceutical trials, and I encourage companies to continue doing that type of work, just getting the compounds out into the public sphere for people to use and try and say, well, this works for this, or this works for that. I had no idea that CBDV is just like nicotine and coffee. That's great. Let's find out if that's true for the entire population, or if it's just a subset of the population with a very specific, uh, very specific genetic makeup. Right? It's we, we need to look at what our goals are before we head down those paths. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that having a goal thing is really important. I think the way the cannabis community currently works is, you know, people finally, they do these phenotype selections and you say you grow 100,000 plants and you find a truly special plant, and then they, they want to breed that, and so they cross it to OG, right? And, and, and that kind of og everything in the market, and it brings back this uniformity, and it's kind of, it's, it's like I said, they, these breeding programs don't have a goal other than I've got something special and I need to do something with it, right? But when you have something special, again, you have to think about what your goal is. Am I trying to replicate this thing that I found into a seed line? But it's like Seth said, you have to start with a goal, right? And every breeding program really has to have a goal. It's not just about throwing pollen around and trying to find something. Paying your mortgage is not an acceptable one of those goals either. <laughs> I'd like to add just a, a different spin on stability, right? So stability, when you when you talk to about it the way Seth talks about it, you, the goal is established and you're going after the specific trait or traits and then the breeding program accentuates that, right? But there's a whole other level of stability in ag that we kind of ignore, right? And that's why we are stuck with clones, right? So. Um, the future of this industry cannot be clone-based. I just want everybody to sort of think that. Um, but the only way to make it not clone-based is to understand basic breeding techniques and to then to breed for what is true stability so that you can have a unique donor, a pollen donor, a unique you know, flower donor, and then every time you breed them, you get the same genetics out, right? And so that requires a lot of inbreeding, back-crossing, traditional, you know, agricultural breeding that we do not do yet in this industry, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't have, I don't have too much to add other than, other than, um, I, 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 would, I would second what you're, what you're saying, absolutely, and, and, and as well as stability, you know, the, I think when you're, when you're breeding for, for, you know, traits outside of the chemotypic traits, um, you know, that, that's a whole thing, but the, the Achieving stability with, with the, your chemotypic analysis is, is, is important too. And, and I think um, early on, the laboratories didn't necessarily even have a state, you know, the, the, the right kind of tools um, to give these guys all the information they need. So I don't think it's necessarily um, the breeding community's fault. It's I think they didn't necessarily have the tools until really recently um, to, 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 to go in and, and actually breed for, for some of these chemotypic traits that, that now we're starting to see kind of explode at, as, as a laboratory. I mean, we didn't have analytical standards for a lot of the compounds you guys are, are actually expressing in the plant now. That's a good point. Well, we know that chemical analytical testing services have really blazed a trail by which producers could derive insight and really understand sort of what the inventory of the plants were. I felt very fortunate in Oregon to have met a man named Pat Marshall, who was actually doing testing um, from the mid-90s, and really was an activist chemical analyst 
who was looking at 64 compounds. I know that there was a grower ecosystem that started to circle around that chemist, who were the people who actually understood what the inventory in the state was, and that it was game-changing in Oregon to have just a single lab that was available and offering the service. And now we, of course, have really many at-scale mature labs, SC Labs and Steep Hill, to two really prominent industry leaders. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about a bit of like this trend where you started and it was a steep hill where it was you know, this, uh, this initial effort that was um, very challenging to even, when you, you deal with like producers coming into a very low margin scenario and expecting to get basically unlimited services for nearly nothing and you have capital intensive equipment and high paid scientists and this, I mean, just this unbelievable complexity. Just a little bit about the, uh, your messy birth. Well, yeah, early on, actually, early on, it was a really boring job. I mean, we, we were analyzing for, for three cannabinoids that we could get reference standards for on a GC, so we weren't even looking at acidic cannabinoids. We were looking at THC, CBD, and CBN. And all day long, you kind of look at the same chromatograph over and over and over. Sometimes the peak can be a little higher, sometimes a little bit lower. But, you know, we're, we're, we're just analyzing for THC. This is even before, you know, we even have an idea of, of testing for terpenes. And, uh, um, and, and I remember the very first... CBD strain that came through, it was like, oh wow, something different. And that was the OG cross with blueberry from, from Harborside. And that was the first, first CBD strain that I know that was being sold kind of in, in California as, as kind of a verified CBD strain. Now, anyone could have just went and talked to a, a hemp reader, obviously, but, um, <laughs> but on the drug market, it was the first one that's commercially available, and you just changed everything. And, and now, I mean, we have 14, 15 um, cannabinoids that most of the labs are testing for, um, dozens of chirpings, and so. Um, you know, it's, it's come a long way and it's become a much more interesting job. But still, for so long, we're seeing kind of the same chromatograms a lot. And, and, and now, it's just been really exciting to, to, to watch the work these guys have done because it, it makes our job more interesting and, and, and we're, we're actually, all these extra compounds we're testing for, now it makes sense. I mean, again, like I said, we really, um, you know, up until the last few years, we've had, you know, high THC, high CBD, maybe a little bit of CBG, one or two or percent, and, and, you know, green crack or something like that, and, and you know, six or seven terpenes really expressed and, 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 and it's been just exciting to see kind of this come through and sometimes it's by accident sometimes you see someone doesn't even know what they have and but but um you can only go so far on that and, and, and so it, it, it's, it's really been really really changed you know even just in the last few years um so the so messy messy birth so i i mean i think he when he started he started with steve so well and so the messy birth he was just describing, I think, describes exactly what I would say anyway. But I would like to add to that that the other part of your statement where people come in and expect all this free testing for the margins, I cannot tell you how many times I have heard the, hey, you should let us test for free because we'll make your lab better. <laughs> okay, no problem. So let me pay me first, and then if it's different, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> because it's exactly what Josh said, they all kind of look the same. Right? And um, it's only more recently that the job really has expanded, you know. And one of the things that we are noticing from this expansion is that we've really done a lot of damage to this plant, right? So a recent paper came out where there are some compounds that you can only find in CBD lineages because we've broken the THC pathway so badly, right? So, so one of the things that has to come out of, I think, all of this is our understanding of what we left behind and how to try to get it back, so. The, the people who are out on the forefront of the analytical chemistry side, uh, what we're seeing is great because there's analytical chemistry available to growers now, but I can tell you that one lab is not the same as another. Um, if, if anybody has submitted flower samples to a, a lab for testing, you know this. We can take one flower, submit it to a lab, and like say a CBG flower, we'll get a 20% result back. We send it to a lab that we trust, and we get you know, 16% back. That's 4%, but 4% in that situation is 25% of the total cannabinoids. It's a big deal. It's a huge margin of error. Uh, you send it to another lab, and they tell you it's CBN. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's... And this is in Oregon with accredited labs, uh, labs that are accredited by national uh, organization. Uh, so they have to go through potency standards, they have, they've been screened, they've been tested over and over, but there's still a huge disparity between good labs and not so good labs. Way to preempt and segue. The Sorry. Interlab variability conversation I think is a doozy because 
here we have the ability for the first time in history to really understand the inventory of this plan. <clears throat> Simultaneously, we have consumers who do not trust the output of the analytical testing facilities due to this interlab variance. And the reality is, as a producer, I can affirm that I can find such an unbelievably gross range testing between different analytical testing services that as a dispensary founder, one of the things I had to do was simply require everybody to test through one lab because I wanted to have a patient resource that actually started to provision accurately curated cultivars or chemovars. And, and the reality is, I think even in 2018 and now into 2019, we expect to continue to, continue to see interlab variability. Can you speak to any of the efforts that are afoot to ultimately resolve some of this challenge to provide consumers and patients with reliable information? So interlab variability starts at the grower. I just want to say that, right? So yes, labs actually have their own issues. I'd be lying if I said different. We make mistakes, machines go out of calibration, they break, et cetera, et cetera, right? But at the same time, we're dealing with a very heterogeneous plant where you can have from one bud to another on the same plant a 10% variance in THC, right? So the question then becomes is, how is the sample coming into the lab first, you know? how consistently are the samples that are being batched together to, to make a, a, a regulatory batch, how, how consistent is it in the grow? And then what is the lab then doing to make sure that they minimize that homogeneity or its heterogeneity by the proper lab technique in the lab, right? So I, I would like to say that labs like SC and us, and you know, if you see a 10% difference between SC and us, a 10%, 10% in science is actually an acceptable number. It may not, may not make you happy as a client, but it's an acceptable number in science. If you're plus or minus 10%, you're pretty good. You want to be plus or minus 5%, but realistically, in a very heterogeneous matrix, that's a good number. Um, but at the same time, I will also say that because of the stuff that's going on, and labs now have to be ISO certified, and, and as ISO certification comes along, you actually have to do a lot more jumping through hoops. It was okay to get your CRMs, or certified reference materials, from one, one provider before. Well, now that you're ISO accredited, uh, if you're ISO accredited, you can't do that. You have to have multiple sources for your CRMs so that you can cross-check them before you even use them in your analytical batch, right? So, so because of that, what we're seeing is, we, I was just in another like cross-lab comparison for an R&D sample thing for somebody out of state, and they tested with three labs, and all three labs came in within one or two percent most of the time, right? So a lot of the interlab variability is going away, and I, I want to add to that, that was with terpenes, Josh will, will, will tell you. Getting terpenes right because they're so volatile is really hard. So we had three labs in this cross comparison that all came in within like in terpenes that no higher than a five to six percent difference, right? So the labs were getting better, right? But we all had the same exact single batch oil we were working with, right? So the oil that we started with was very homogeneous. So you have to add those things together and understand the whole process, I think, so. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll start with California because I think, I think the, the two states, and we have a lot in, in, in outside of Portland as well, and I think the two states have very different regulatory regimes and I think, they, um, I think, I think different challenges. So not like California is regulated, um, labs are forced to do a lot more quality control, have run LQCs, quality control samples, with every batch that check that calibration so your machine can't drift out of calibration so you you know you can catch and carry over you can catch all these issues that prop up and a lot of labs weren't doing that before and there's a lot of reasons price pressure you know when you're, when you're in a voluntary market and you can only get you know 50 60 bucks for a test that should be 150 um you know quality is going to suffer and, and, and people are going to cut corners now in california you have a lot of new labs in the market because you know everyone thought they saw billions of dollars in the testing market, which is silly, but and, and, and jumped in and, and, and bought a bunch of equipment and didn't necessarily have the wherewithal or, or haven't had the time to get up to speed since we're all you know developing our own methods. And so you're going to see a little bit of that in California as well, but at least in California, what we've seen is the regulators are going to come down on you and shut you down if you're not doing a good job, and, and that's been proven out. So, so that's, that's the key thing, is, is good oversight from the people who are regulating the labs. If you're not going to have good oversight on the people regulating the labs, then why aren't we doing any of this? you know, mandatory testing. Um, because otherwise you have what happens in Oregon where you have several labs that are just openly, you know, kind of, I don't know how they're doing it, but getting, getting their customers an extra five, six percentage points, not relative, absolute, on their THC, THC test. 
And, and you know, we have customers that come to us and, and you know, even say, well, sure, we'll, we'll do some pesticide testing with you, but sorry, we can't do cannabinoid testing with you. It's a, it's a comp competition thing, and we've had so much downward pressure in, Oregon, in the Oregon market that they need those extra few points to, to, to sell their product, and they know that they, everyone knows what's going on, and the state's not doing a damn thing about it. And so, you know, I, I, I would, you know, or that, or, you know, it, 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 it's not a good oversight system, and so it's allowing this to happen. What it does is it drives the labs that are not, not cheating out of business. Yeah. And, and, and so that's the same thing's gonna happen in California if the regulators ever kind of get lax on the labs. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pain in the ass, and, and, it, and I get scared every time I get a call from the BCC, but really that's what's gonna keep the labs that are doing it right in business. It's a strong oversight of, of the testers, because if they put us in the kind of hall monitor position, someone has to be keeping a really good eye on the fact that, that we're doing what we need to do because we, we serve a very critical function and then there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, I guess, incentive for you know, bad actors or laziness and both of them can be equally as damaging. Well said, such a critical point. Just as an example, Josh just said that drives the, the good actors out of business. I just shut my New Mexico lab down for exactly for that reason, so. Wow, ouch. And, so, oh. Yeah, and I think part of that too, you got to remember is we as a as an industry and as a consumer base are actually responsible for this too, right? Like, you don't go into a, a wine store or a liquor store and, and ask, you know, what's the highest alcohol content beer? What's the highest alcohol alcohol content whiskey or wine? Right? It's just it's not the way that we consume those products. And uh, when we put such a, a pressure on these on on, on labs, really because people want to get these high dollars for high THC content. It's just nonsense. It's, that's, that's not a good metric of quality. And uh, I think that we, you know, we really need to do a better job of teaching consumers that it's not, you know, that's not the way to find good product for your, for your ailment. You don't go into a dispensary and say, hey, what's the highest? Or people do, but they shouldn't, right? So. so the Greeks have this word called ashatos, which is like the final thing. But really, uh, it's also the beginning of a new thing. And the mirror, or the, rather, the metaphor I've heard is you throw the stone into the pond and the ripples are happening, but the time is actually the ripples that have already occurred after the event that has um, been the central event. There's this notion of when ca chemical analytical testing came into cannabis, it fundamentally disrupted the long-term consumer relationship that had fomented in the underground and the prohibition era especially. And my sense is that what we're living through is actually a lot of ripples. We've already now have the ability to actually get out of sort of interlab variability and have really reliable testing data. But that, that means now we have to update everything else. And I think a lot of the frustration, and I've heard some of it expressed here, and I certainly feel an abundance of it, is that we have a consumer trend pursuing high THC over any other quality. We have um, growers who I was just talking to, brilliant, like some of the best growers we have, having to sell much worse flour that are testing really high or testing at labs that are uh, unscrupulous. We have indica and sativa frameworks, which are sort of cultural um, attributes that we can't actually define by science. We, have, we just have so much catching up to do. And I guess I'm just wondering if there's any sort of, like, here we've got analytical breeding at scale. We have a future to look forward to of moderately dosed products that are incredibly chemo diverse and very sophisticated and able, able to speak to people's needs. But what we really have in the way is a education and sort of popular education platform issue with how, how do we get the consumers and the patients and, and the market to actually sort of um, acknowledge this event which has occurred, which is that we must reframe how we view cannabis now. Any thoughts about that? I'll do a small start. I'd say that those ripples, it's a great metaphor, the ripples are definitely out there, but most of them are not from THC. Uh, I think most of the ripples in the pond around us right now are non-psychoactive cannabinoids, and that's your grandmother who is responsible for a lot of the shift in public perception. Uh, THC is a niche drug. I love it. Uh, but only about 20% of the population consumes it. And even then, only a small portion, about 20% of that 20%, drives the actual consumption patterns. Those are the people that you need to target in terms of education and making sure that they're on board with new knowledge about uh, terpene diversity or flavor profiles and the, the different effects of that, that those will have on you. Um, but it's those other markets with different compounds that is the other 80% of the population and then animals and, and that sort of stuff, I think where the popular consciousness actually gets a hold of this plant, where you can see that it's not just for recreational use or for certain aspects of pain that come along with psychoactive uh, implications. There's, there's a whole lot more out there. 
including the replacement of hops. We don't need hops anymore. Hops, uh, I love them, they're, they're a cousin, right? But they take a huge amount of agricultural infrastructure. They take five years to get to maturity, and every five years, 20% of the hop vines in Oregon and Washington get ripped out because of disease. With cannabis, you can have a single, you can have a crop that grows once every year, gets replaced by seed, and produces exactly the same compounds that hops do. So this is, popular consciousness is already changing, and I think it's being carried out by a lot of different people. It's not just our burden in a place like this, it's society that's, that's moving it forward. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to everybody to go down and check out too. I mean, there's a company here called Phytology, a dispensary from Oakland, and they've got this variety guava jam that, you know, like I said, one, I guess it was a CBD last year, but if you haven't tried it and you're interested in these plants with different compounds, I, I suggest going and getting yourself a pre-roll of this stuff and trying it out. It's a CBD, CBDV plant with like one milligram of THC per gram. It's like extremely low THC content, but when you smoke this, and you know, about five, 10 minutes later, I don't know if I would describe it as nicotine, caffeine, but you definitely feel an effect, right? And when you, when you smoke this stuff and then you realize, hey, I'm high, and then you think it in the context of, wait, there was no THC in that plant, right? And uh, I think it kind of recalibrates our expectations because really it's about experience. It's not about, it's about a user experience. It's not about, again, this high THC number. So check it out if you haven't tried those things. Okay, well, and, and I, I've got a few things, I think. I mean, one of the big reasons I think THC is kind of such a, has it become what it, what it is as far as is, is kind of selection of, of purchasing decisions is it's the cost of cannabis. I mean, it costs $50 for an eighth of cannabis and you get a couple of joints out of it. I mean, I would want the biggest bang for my buck too. It's expensive. And it's, it's you know, and, and, and so as we see kind of cannabis kind of come down to kind of earth in, in price, Maybe, maybe people will just kind of start to drift away from that and start looking back at, I want cannabis that tastes good. Um, I want, you know, I want quality cannabis. And so, I mean, if, you're, if, you, if, you, if you really have the need to measure something, the lab should be cheating on a total terpene content because I, I would say that that's your, your quantitative quality indicator much more so than THC at least. Um, and, and, and so, um, I, I just think, I think naturally over time as, as cannabis becomes more available, it's more reasonably priced. And consumers will start looking, looking to other things. Just you know, how high can I get off of you know a couple hits? And so, um, hopefully, it'll, it'll sort itself out a little bit too. And, and, and I agree, the other cannabinoids um, in, in, in are, are the future in, 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 in a much wider, wider market than than just THC. So the the idea that THC drives everything. The reality is that you know if we were to use the proper terminology, we, we get high. Well, CBD gets you high, but in a different way, right? I mean, it, so the term is psycho, psychotropic versus, you know, psychoactive, but it's still psycho, right? So, so, <laughs> well, okay, that came out wrong, however. <laughs> uh, but still, it, meaning that you, no matter how you look at it, you're still having an effect on the brain, right? So, so one of the effects gets you high, but I, I, I would like everybody to, who has not yet smoked CBD by itself, to go smoke CBD and tell me if you don't feel more relaxed afterwards, right? And if you were feeling more relaxed, I'm sorry, but you got high. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, so, so, so that's one aspect as well. And, and I think the other aspect is, you know, if we, if we start to, to think back to old school weed like Acapulco Gold and Panama Red, right? So those things only make four, six, eight percent, but they made a tremendous amount of terpenes. If you look at land races in general, right, you see a much broader terpene content where you have a much higher expression on more terpenes. Well, back in the day, we got really high off of that stuff because of the terpene, the entourage effect, right? What we see now is that as you go and drive up, the, the THC content, the terpene profile gets narrower, and the number of things that express at a high level go down. So the chase for THC may not be getting us where we really want to go. Wonderful. Since we have about five minutes, I want to make sure you get access to these geniuses. Does anybody have questions? And by the way, if you have not heard Shango Willis's interview with Seth Crawford talking about some of the analytical breeding methodology he did on the Shaping Fire podcast, where some of the best content I've heard in the last couple of years publicly shared is, I would highly recommend checking out that podcast. It's amazing. Yo, Shango. So, so similarly, the
the brain trust on the stage has got me so jacked and excited. This is, I wish I could enjoy this all the time. Um, so my question for you as all technology assisted breeder folk who I respect, you know, there's this continuum. We've got, we've got, you know, males and females to make new progeny. We've been doing that for ages. Now we've got uh, analytical uh, abilities to, you know, uh, really look at what we're doing and help speed up processes, right? And then we've got the part that, um, you know, people are talking about like, in, like invasive breeding, right? When you're starting to like get involved with CRISPR and, and you know, you know uh, editing the, the genome, right? So as people who I, everybody here I respect, where do you personally put that threshold on where along the line is reasonable and worthwhile to press to reach these goals that we have before you're all like, okay, that's where I'm gonna draw my line for whatever reason you do. I'll, I'll start because I just don't have much, but I, I would say there's so much left to do before we hit that line um, that you know, let, let's, let's exhaust those options first and then we can start talking about CRISPR and things like that. But I think, um, I mean, listen, listen to the things Seth's doing, Mark and, and, and Ryan, I mean, there's, there's, they're, they're doing amazing things, and they're not, you know, they're not editing anything. So, um, you know, I, I think, I think this, this plant can do a lot once we start pushing it. So, for thousands of years, we, we didn't have CRISPR or, or wow. anything, right? So, and we did a good job on all our plants. So, you know, traditional, traditional genetic breeding is a very powerful tool. The, the most powerful tool set in that tool is the breeder himself. You have to be able to observe, you have to be able to take notes, you have to be able to record and follow over trends. If you can do that, you, you, you've got the game beat pretty much, right? So yes, you can do better if you have analytical tools, and ultimately, the, the ultimate expression of that is to take those analytical tools, find out what the chemical compounds are, because they, they are your metrics by which you measure, and then dive into the genome so that now you can, you can do it faster and, and, and increase generational cycles, right? So, if you can look at the seed as soon as it's cracked, you have your seedlings and you can do a genetic test and you find you have all the alleles you want, then you're off to the races, you get rid of the rest, you, you force flower those guys and you do your next round, right? So you can really do generational cycling as many as four to six a, a, a year if you have the right tools, right? So, so that's ultimately where we need to go, but CRISPR is one of those things where when you've maxed out everything you can possibly do, you do gene editing, right? So we are nowhere near, nowhere near that, right? Not to mention the fact that what we're finding out is that CRISPR makes other mistakes other places that we don't know about, so. CRISPR for cannabis is like someone who can't quite pay attention long enough to get through a sentence. Honest, honest, honest to God, it's, at this point, I, I feel the same way. Uh, is these two gentlemen. There's so much that hasn't been discovered at this point. Why, why go down a path that could potentially introduce all kinds of problems? Um, for At least with our breeding program, there's so many, every time we submit samples, we get something that comes back that says, you know, there's a, there's a spike on your chromatogram and we don't know what it is. I don't either. So, you know, it goes another two or three years. Um, so, Got an MMR? What's that? Got an yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there is, when you look at the history of plant breeding, uh, traditional plant breeding with other crops, um, it's gone through phases. And the, the first major phase in the Green Revolution was the advent of hybrids, the creation of F1s, which require line breeding of two separate lines and then recombination once you fix the specific traits that you want, uh, followed by with field trials to establish which of those parental lines are the best. Uh, that's an awesome, it's an awesome program. The next stage after that was mutagenesis. And so this is uh, involving either uh, ploidy increases or decreases. So we're talking in cannabis now about creating haploid lines, which uh, basically have half the chromosomes of the plant. But those chromosomes, when you double it again, lead to true breeding stock with one generation. It's a, it's a huge uh, generational leaping tool for cannabis breeders. It doesn't require, this is something that happens naturally in nature, no, I wouldn't say it on a regular basis, but it does happen, and all we're doing is inducing that quicker in a lab. CRISPR is different. CRISPR is, uh, is, a, is a very different animal, um, and I think we're not there yet, in my, my opinion. Yeah, I take kind of a different approach. I mean, I'm not opposed to CRISPR. CRISPR is just a tool to, do, to edit the genome, right? And there's all these other tools like Talon or, you know, zinc finger nucleases and all these things that we can use. 
to do that. Um, but cannabis is a special plant in that it breeds very similar to the way that humans breed. I mean, if you think about a tomato, for example, a tomato is you know, grown in the greenhouse and a bee comes along and pollinates it, it self-pollinates, and it produces a seed in a tomato where if that, if that tomato didn't come from a hybrid seed, it came from an heirloom tomato seed, you can take that seed out of the tomato and plant it and grow it into a new plant, and the fruit on that plant would be identical to the plant that it came from, and so on and so forth for 20 generations. Well, we all know that when we grow cannabis, and you, you cross two plants together, that the plants that come out at the end, they don't look like that, and that's because we're what we call obligate outcrossers. You need to have another individual of the same species to procreate, and that brings in a separate genome um, into the mix, which creates this huge level of diversity. So what Seth is talking about in mutagenesis, it's like he said, when you have your goal, the second thing that you want to look for in a breeding program is finding the variability upon which you can select. And cannabis is a really remarkable plant, being an outcrosser, because it has all this inherent variability. So we can go through the genome and look for special things. And, um, and you know, every trait ex essentially exists on a continuum. We have low cannabinoid producing plants, we have high cannabinoid producing plants, we have tall plants and short plants, and high yielding plants and low yielding plants. And essentially any trait that you can characterize has this variability, right? So, um, on the CRISPR note though, CRISPR allows us to do these special things. I mean, a couple of days ago they just published a method in, uh, in a rice variety for producing apomictic seed. So I don't know if anyone knows what apomictus is, but it's essentially a, an ability of a plant to produce a seed without sexual combination, so, or a sexual recombination. So you might imagine that um, if we had a, a, an apomictic cannabis line, it would produce seeds without pollination from an external plant, and all of the seeds would be identical to the parent plant. Right? Well, that's really valuable for for mass planting on fields and things like that. So there, there definitely is a use for these technologies, and I think that we will see them shortly. Yeah. Uh, so Dave Watson has talked about how he made uh, specific strains with a single cannabinoid, uh, more for the pharmacological aspect. How relevant is that breeding program these days with fractionalized distillation as a viable option? Does a plant actually have to be a single cannabinoid for the FDA to use it, or can we use distillation techniques to get those uh, results? You, you can as long as they're present in the plant, and a, and a lot of these compounds are not present in certain plant lines, and you can't make them express enough to get uh, economically viable uh, total total well content. It's that's a it's an excellent point. Um, part of this as well is making your plants more economically efficient. If you have a pure CBG line, it gives you the opportunity to, to magnify that total compound based on how much people need. Um, but you're, you're completely right. I think the, the chemistry and the technological side of our industry uh, is starting to catch up with, with that stuff. I think the combination of those two things, plant breeding and technology, uh, continues to make us more efficient than yeast. I, I want to point out too that um, you know, yeah, we can do all those things through chemistry and, you know, specific extractions using CO2 equipment or whatever, but it's it's always more efficient if you have a plant that already almost appro approaches your goal. So if you have a plant that produces 99% CBGA, for example, of the cannabinoid fraction and the other 1% is THC or CBG, there's less work to go to do by chemistry, right? And it saves labor, it saves costs. So in terms of delivering your product to market efficiently and on a cost-efficient basis, it's better to have a plant that, that does most of the work in the plant rather than have to go in through technology and change it after the fact. Do you happen to know the time frame of that breeding program to get those results? Yeah, well, Dave's a good friend of mine, so you know I know all about that breeding program. It was done through, they were, it was actually the, really the first program, uh, first series of breeding programs that was conducted through uh, selfing technology and, and gynecious, gynecious breedings. And it, it really only took a couple of months. Once, once you identify your targets, you'd be surprised with gynecious meetings, what you can do in a couple of generations. Okay. Thank you. So I would like to caution the, the, the whole distillation process only because from the analytical lab side, what we see is people are, are well, when you combine regulatory testing with distillation, you end up with a situation where a lot of what you expect to see, Delta 9, is gone, right? So it turns into Delta 8 or Delta 10 or whatever else, and suddenly now you're not dealing with the same compound. So distillation does not necessarily also get you what you want. 
there, there's it's one other element that it can have. I'd love to just uh, acknowledge that thankfully we're on the um, this panel and not the synthetic cannabinoids panel. Yeah. Ultimately, there really is a scaling of yeast produced cannabinoids. It was wild to be at ICRS this year and meet the team from India who could produce things very efficiently and cost effectively and to see the Kronos partnership with Ginkgo Bioworks and to start to watch in the foment, you know, these big swirling energies around synthetic cannabinoids and I promise. Um, they're really, you know, it's very easy to produce at scale, very pristine individual compounds. And the reality is, I think all of us share, and, and this movement really is um, sharing a passion for the plant, a passion for the way the plant, through using technology and all of the tools that, that are available to us to ultimately facilitate, you know, the best possible use and relationship of it. And I just really want to appreciate and celebrate that there's so many new tools that have arrived. There are so many brilliant people in this conversation. And now there's a lot of clinical research and other things that need to substantiate what these new plants and new ratios of compounds can produce in quality of life. And I believe we're really going to change the world. I have a faith in this every morning when I wake up. But it's mainly because I get to sit near all of you. Um, I think our time is up. It's really